Hello, I'm Craig Thielen, and this is the 1% Better Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Tim Egerbratton, otherwise known as the Off-Duty Chief. Tim is a motivational speaker, musician, and author of the book, Find Your Beat, where he shares his entire life story, including 25 years of law enforcement and all of the inspiring challenges, life lessons, and things he used to to work through it all. Um, and really, as he says, get into the rhythm of life. So we'll dig into all of that and welcome to 1% Better Town. Uh, it's awesome to be here, Craig. Thank you. All right. Well, Tim, our connection is Detroit Lakes. You spent a lot of time there, even though you weren't born there. Uh, you, I think you were born a, a little bit north of there uh, and north of me, which, uh, which I was born in Callaway, Minnesota. But you, you were in Detroit Lakes for many, many years, and I think that's still your home base today. And of course, I grew up in that area. I went to high school there. And thankfully, we never met each other back in those days because you were the police chief. And so I'm very thankful for that. But it's a beautiful part of the world. And uh, we used to call it a sleepy little resort town. But I'm sure you have a lot of uh, stories that say otherwise than sleepy, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was going to be a one-year stop for my wife and I. And We'd never even been to Detroit Lakes. It was, uh, we both went to college at Moorhead State. And Mm -hmm. after that, it was like, well, just looking for jobs all over the state. And I'd kind of taken a map and circled towns that were 30,000 people or more and and just started applying everywhere to be a police officer. And I was working in the jail in Moorhead and I knew I wanted to be a cop and, and Detroit Lakes was hiring. And I thought, well, We'll give it a shot and then got here, interviewed, you know, tested and interviewed and stuff and and got the job offer. And then it was, well, we'll give them a year and then uh, go back to like Moorhead or a bigger town. And about two weeks after I got hired in Detroit Lakes, Mankato offered me a job and then Grand Forks okay. offered me, you know, two weeks into the gig here, fell in love with. Detroit Lakes, and 32 years later, here we are. The way it goes. Well, and we do have a a bit of an international audience. And so for those not familiar with the area, Minnesota, of course, in the middle of the U.S., and uh, the Twin Cities, where I'm based out of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Detroit Lakes is about three hours north and a couple hours from Canada. So we'd call that northern Minnesota is kind of the location. So Tim, you know, the book that you wrote, um, which is just a, a wonderful book, and it's really the story of your life. And it has, you know, all the highs and the lows. And I was reading it. I mean, you were very transparent uh, about yeah. a lot of parts of your life that a lot of people don't put out there in the public. And I thought, wow, first of all, I'll give you a lot of credit for sharing that. And second of all, I thought, man, you know, everyone should do this. Like everyone should come clean and say, this is, you know, who I am and what I've done. And again, the highs and the lows, because there's so many learnings from it, you know, for your, not only future, you know, your kids and your own family, but, you know, for future generations and just, and that's mostly what this whole show is about. This podcast is about how we get better in life, personal, professional. And it's usually not one aha moment, although I think you had um, a small aha moment that sort of helped you rethink, you know, your Norman moment that helped you kind of rethink life a little bit. It's usually what you do every day and how you find, look for those improvements, which I think in some ways is what you call the rhythm of life and how you get into that mode. Um, so anyways, I love the book and um, would highly recommend it, but well, maybe just walk us through a little bit. You started a little bit about just your life story and what led you up to even, you know, some decisions that you made, some challenges, and then what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for the compliments on the book. Um, yeah, and that was tough. It was really tough to to lay it out there. It was tough on me. It was tough on my wife and family, you know, to be that that open. But yeah, yeah, growing up in northern Minnesota, I was the youngest of four. I had three older sisters and so I was the favorite son and the, the baby of the family and great childhood growing up, amazing parents, very positive. My mom's motto was, I am, I can, I will. And, and she lived it. And it was so just grew up, you know, believing that I literally could be anything I want to be. And I remember even before. Hey, Tim, just on that saying, which obviously is the big poster board right behind you. And it's a theme yep. in your book. And it's right. You know, where did your, I never, I mean, you might've had it in the book, but where did your mother get that? I don't know if it was just something, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know if it was something that was taught to her mm-hmm. or, you know, she didn't have much growing up. Uh, it was just her and her brother and my, my grandma and uh, her dad died. My mom's dad died uh, when she was very young. And so, I mean, they, 
they were very had a very modest beginning and so i think it was just that uh she had like that superpower of positivity almost annoying you know like, yeah. like right. overload sometimes but uh super positive and i am i can i will was just one of her things that she responded to challenges with with that phrase and it mm -hmm. stuck stuck with me absolutely yeah uh, but yeah, so growing up was awesome and, and great childhood, but I knew before kindergarten that I was going to be a police officer. It was a calling for me and, uh, I didn't stray from that very much throughout my like high school. And I just, I wanted to be a cop and I knew nothing about it. I knew I had some relatives that were in law enforcement, but I didn't know what it was like to be a cop. I just knew that I wanted to be one. And so I went to college and then it was, wasn't until my internship with the Fargo, North Dakota police department that I really got like thrown into this is what police officers do and the nitty gritty of it and uh, uh, worked in corrections for three years and then started here in Detroit Lakes in 1992 and my wife and I have been married we'll celebrate 35 years this in just a couple of weeks so, uh, so she, was, she was my high school yeah thank you she was my high school sweetheart and uh, you know so we know each other well and we she's been with me through the really awesome times and the the crazy times. And, you know, like everybody, we all have challenges in life. And when I was 12, I started drinking alcohol and, uh, uh which I don't think is uncommon, mm -hmm. but what stuck with me on that was that I was really insecure and I didn't recognize any of this. I mean, like when you're in it, I was just, I wasn't comfortable being around other people. And, but then the alcohol leveled the playing field. Sure. And that was like, it was like, I could hang out with anybody. And, and then that was, and just pr that progressed that drinking and uh but it stuck with me through my career and so like i'd go to police officer conventions or conferences and i'd feel like you know i can't hang out with lapd because they're real cops and who am i you know and and it's just that that mindset and that came through in the book when i was writing the books like well who am i to write a book uh you know and just that internal battle that we i think we all sure. tend to face once in a while that's why i love your your motto about that one percent just keep grinding and getting better and and recognizing and acknowledging that we have our deficiencies so how can we continue to push on that and uh, and improve so fast forward you progress in your career you know up the sort of the ranks you became the chief of police in detroit lakes uh, which is you know I guess kind of a, your dream job, you know, ever mm -hmm. since kindergarten. And then you you had a moment, a couple moments. Um, you had, you know, the Norman moment. And then you also had a moment where, like, you couldn't do it anymore. And you had to make a, a decision on if you wanted to continue in this job. So maybe just walk us through those. Um, uh, yeah. So I've always told people, you know, if you don't like your path, change your path. And that's really easy to say, especially if you're telling somebody, you know, it's like, well, just change your path, you know. Well, that's great, but like, there's that security of a job and the the paycheck and the insurance and all of that. But when I was 48 years old, uh, I was chief of police, and I knew that the job was killing me. I mean, it was literally I was drinking excessively, I was overweight, I was in a miserable place in my mind, and and it was dark and. Uh, one of my best friends and partners of 19 years died by suicide like 10 months after I became police chief. And so there's all this stuff going on and 20 plus years of, of trauma that, you know, on the job stuff that I was just stuffing down inside me and I didn't deal with it uh, positively. And so at 48, I knew that that I needed to get out of law enforcement. And at age 50 in the state of Minnesota, we can begin drawing our pension, but we take a penalty. But I didn't care about that because I don't not really good with numbers and, and I've never I didn't want to be a cop to make money, you know. And so most of what I do is just like what fills me and what how can I help people? And then so I never even looked at like what kind of penalty, financial penalty I would take. I just knew that if I stuck around to fifty-five, that I probably wouldn't live. I it was just and I had a great team. I mean, they were true heroes, you know, men and women that always went above and beyond and great people. Uh, but I could feel it just, I didn't, and I didn't want to be that toxic person that we all know, that person that's no fun to be around. They're always miserable. And, and I wasn't, but I could feel myself kind of going down that path. Like 
everybody's an idiot. These are all morons and the, 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 you know, and I just, I could feel it. And I was like, okay, mister, you slow down and let's get this figured out. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I retired. I knew that I've been doing the one man band entertainment thing forever. And, uh, so I knew I was going to be doing music, mm -hmm. but about six months before I retired, the chief of police from Burnsville, Minnesota, down by Minneapolis, he'd ask me if I would share my leadership journey with his leadership team. And mm -hmm. I did, and it was powerful. And we laughed and cried and sang and, and laughed again. You know, and it was, so then I found my second calling, you know, I knew in kindergarten, I was going to be a cop. And mm -hmm. right before I retired, I found my second calling of, of being a professional speaker. And I knew nothing about it. But I knew that that people were resonating with with my message. That yeah, you know, and and this that feeling of when somebody's listening and they're in their mind they're thinking, hey, I'm not alone in this. You know, I'm not the only one that feels crappy sometimes and just dark. And I'm not the only one that turns to alcohol or or something not healthy. And and so when I'm doing that, when I'm sharing techniques on how to be positive, how I'm positive, there was nothing better. And I just got this burning fire inside of me to, to share this message. And, and so then when I retired at age 50, I just, I hired a coach, you know, and like, well, how do I figure this out? How do I do it? And so I just started speaking around the country and, and it's blown up and I'm finding that people, no matter what walk of life they're in, they're starving for mm -hmm. something positive and unique and upbeat. And, uh, and I can provide that and I throw music into it. And, uh, and then the book just kind of came along and with it. It's been a wild ride. Tell us about the Norman moment. Yeah. Uh, so early on in my career, I had developed that us versus them mindset because I thought everybody was going to run away from me, lie to me, or fight me. And I worked a night shift for six and a half years. And my weekends were Mondays and Tuesdays. And, and I loved it. I mean, it was exciting. It was everything being a cop was supposed to be and more. Um, but I really started to get jaded. And where it was my night shift partners, we were the us against pretty much everybody. And that happens. We're all susceptible to that. Where it's, sure. if it's in our families, maybe it's us versus our parents or our kids. And yeah. or maybe it's, you know, obviously we got a big political season brewing right now. And and so there's going to be a lot of that us versus them. And that guy's an idiot. And, and I was really getting stuck into that. And uh, I got a call one night on the radio to go to the Holiday Inn. And check out this guy and, and move him along. And this guy was a homeless guy, basically. And uh, he was coming from Minneapolis on the bus, going to Detroit, Michigan. And he saw a sign that said Detroit Lakes and <laughs> thought, oh, must be close enough. And so he got off and, and he had this idea that he was going to revolutionize how vehicles are made in Detroit, okay. Michigan. Okay. Yeah. So it's just a simple, kind guy that was confused and maybe some mental health issues going on, right. but just a, a simple guy. It ended up, I got him a hotel room and, and it wasn't, my interaction with him is maybe 20, 25 minutes. And he had these brown eyes that there was just, I can't even describe them, but there was just something about his eyes that huh. knocked me down. And right before I was leaving the hotel where I dropped him off at, he said, wait a minute. And he looked at me with those brown eyes. He was looking at me and it felt like he was looking into my soul. And I was just like locked into his gaze. And all he said was, I want to remember the people who have helped me. Huh. And I, I didn't know what to say. I had nothing to say. I just broke my gaze with him. I went to my police car and I started to cry. And so the Tim Agerbrot at that stage of life did not cry. Not right. against it. Absolutely. Not a sign of weakness. Yeah. And there I was, and I remember thinking to myself, who have I become? Because that was not the Tim Agerbrotten that Kenny and Pat Agerbrotten raised to be caring and thoughtful and conscientious and to help people. But somewhere along that early path, I had lost my, my focus. And Norman, just by being himself, this kind and gentle man, had made me recognize that my rhythm of life was offbeat and I was becoming crusty and and I needed to do something about it. And uh, so then throughout my career, then I ended up finding Norman. He had died, but somebody at a conference that I was speaking at said, I think I can help you find him, you know, and I wasn't really looking, you know, but uh, he was a, a Korean War vet and he's buried at the Fort Snelling okay. uh, National Cemetery in Minneapolis. And, and I found his headstone and that was a process in itself. And right. just a, 
a beautiful thing. So this man who had a profound impact on me just by being himself made me recognize that each one of us uh, has an opportunity to be a Norman or a Norma for other people. And then these Normans and these Normans are everywhere. And if we're we're so busy all the time and our minds are cluttered that we might bump into these people at the grocery store or something. And But when we stop and recognize and just like see that person, there's just something about some people. So, and I don't know, I mean, I'm a faith, I have a Christian faith. And so I believe that God put Norman into my life. Um, not everybody has that belief, yeah. but I do believe yeah. that, I do believe that that people are put into our lives for a reason. And uh, a man rocked my world. So where was that? Okay, so you retired at 48? Yeah, I retired at 50, but I at knew 50. at 48. Yeah. It, so where was Norman? What age were you when you met him? Uh, probably 26 or 27. Okay, so very early in your yeah. career. Okay. Yeah. And so what do you think it was? Because you might have had dozens of interactions with similar interactions with people saying, Hey, I just want to thank you. And you, you yeah. help them along or whatever. And you just brush it up. Oh, no worries. Um, that's my job. What do you think it was? Was it just like that? It was the right thing at the right time. Was it him or was it like you were just like at a breaking point? Like what caused that emotion in you to come out? Do you think? I think it's all of the above. I think it's the timing, the like where I was at, because I think these people are around us and I think events happen yeah. uh, every day. But mm -hmm. then like I always look at it like it's a big jigsaw puzzle, our life. And then there's pieces getting put in and they might be a small piece and we might not recognize a bigger picture just because of that small piece. But then like with my drinking, you know, like I was getting all these puzzle pieces put in, you know, this the mistakes that I'd make and and the good things that I did and whatever. I mean, they're all puzzle pieces. So I think Norman was a piece that was put in to my puzzle at a time where there were enough pieces around there. And it started to be really clear to me that, dude, if you stay down this path that you're on, this crusty us yep. against them, it's going nowhere fast. And because uh, that's not who I am. And, yep. and this idea that that we can just sit back and wait for somebody to make us happy or or make us, you know, that person made me mad. Baloney. They, you know, right. nobody can make us anything. Right. Right. And uh, so it was just a wake up moment. And it was one of many. I mean, now, and then in the process of writing the book where you just sit down in a room and you start throwing ideas on paper or in the computer, then it really started to to string out and that those puzzle pieces started getting put in for me that like I recognized moments that I thought were, like you said, I kind of brush them off at the time, but they ended up being like a, a substantial piece of that puzzle somewhere, you know, like where I'm at today. And, and I'm thankful for the mistakes. Um, I got arrested uh, with a DWI a year after I retired or like six months after I retired. And so that I'm thankful for that. Mm. I'm thankful for everything that's happened because here I am talking to Craig Thielen on a podcast and I would, you know, I mean, just the, the ideas that I don't know, nothing happens by accident. Yeah, for sure. And how one thing leads to another. And we've talked about this on previous podcasts. Um, sometimes people call it the butterfly effect, but yeah. the power of one conversation is the power of one interaction in what, how that's impacted you. I mean, just look at all the things that you've done. It's, and it, it's not all because of that one interaction, but so I'm curious, just go back to that. Cause I do, I believe what you said is 100% true. I think things are constantly happening around us. And sometimes we just have this kind of tunnel view and we're busy with life. We're busy with our job, kids, what, what have you. And we just, we miss all the things that are happening around us. And it's just being able to um, be aware and observe and pay attention and those things can change your life so when that happened you obviously it impacted you immediately but did you just go okay i gotta get back and do my job get back in my routine or did it immediately change your behaviors and thinking or was it something that built over a course of months and years afterwards both you know right away like i woke up the next morning and he had lost his jacket in the men's room at Walmart where they dropped him off. And, uh, you know, and so then after my interaction with him, I got home like probably three o'clock in the morning, went to bed and I woke up probably eight or nine o'clock in the morning and he was right on my mind. And I thought, you know what? I have several coats, jackets, you know, I could 
just grab one and bring it to him. You know, so I was already thinking like what a schmuck I was for thinking about myself. Oh, poor me, poor me. And that's the mode I was in. Yep. So I, I grabbed a jacket. Of course, he was gone already. But uh, but then it was I started sharing that story and there were details like his eyes and he is wearing brown dress shoes. And I will never forget his brown dress shoes or his brown eyes. And it's like, so yeah, it impacted me right away. And then of course, like, like everything that, that stays for a while. And then we make some improvements or whatever in your attitude and then things happen. And then you go down again, but he's always there. He's all, he will always be like a, a memory for me. Uh, and then so like a, a grounding force, you know, that, that can help me like reset sometimes when I think about Norman and I think about all these people, if I'm holding the door open or if somebody holds the door open for me or just something somebody says, or just, I don't, you know, it, it's not the big things like they pull you out of a burning car and do CPR on you. I mean, those are great, but it's like those little things that, that people do for us, but then when we can turn that around and stop focusing on ourselves, like, oh, you know, it's like, and when we can turn that around and write somebody a letter saying, hey, man, I appreciate you, inspire me. And when you do stuff like that, then it just, it fuels us. So it's, it's just one drop of water. You know, Norman was one, like literally a 20 minute interaction in my 57 and a half years of life right Back. now. And, but it's huge impact. But it also makes you think, I mean, uh, that how you interact with other people is in, can be incredibly impactful. Just taking someone like he didn't have to like, he could have just said, hey, thanks, man. And he could have walked away and you would have right. never paid attention. But that little extra like, hey, I'm, he was serious. And it was like, yeah. like you said, he looked into you and like, we can all do that with every interaction. We can be yeah. very sincere and we can make it something that's memorable and that may impact somebody, right? I yeah. mean, so it's how we act too. So there's a movie, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, a book called, in a, in a movie called Peaceful Warrior. Have you ever heard of it? It's uh, Nick Nolte. And if it, it really highlights this whole idea of like being aware of things that are around you and how like you control your emotions, you control how you react, but we can program ourselves to say, oh, the world's bad luck, the world's against me, and just how to be open and be more aware. It's a great movie. It's an even better book called The Peaceful Warrior. So it talks a lot about that. So let's switch gears a little bit. Music is a huge part of your life, right? Ever since being a, a kid in your family and then throughout your career, you've always had it as something that you've done, you've played it um, socially and then professionally. and and now it continues to be, and you've kind of woven together, you know, a number of things. You've woven together your life experience as a cop. You had some tragedies with, a, you know, partner suicide. You had some personal challenges, you know, during, after you retired, intermixed music now into your whole message, right? Into your book and into your message. And, and so just t talk a little bit about that and what, why it's almost like it's like a, it takes the combination of things and it enhances it. And what is, how does music do that? Uh, I think we're all wired, you know, it's in our DNA with rhythm and music and the, whatever the genre of music is. I think there's something about it, you know, way back in, you know, thousands of years ago when, you know, people would communicate with drums or with rhythm and, and, you know, we were, taught our ABCs and we sing them. And, and so we remember that. And we remember if we're doing something, if there's a big part of our life where it's the first dance we've ever had or the first kiss or, you know, something that's that's memorable. And if there's a song playing and it just gets like hardwired in us. So I think music is such a an integral part of who we are. And I was whistling before I could speak. I literally always have a song going on in my head and it's not like an annoying thing it's just like i just always have a tune and usually it's tied into something that's going on and i don't mm -hmm. hardly pay attention to it but it's it's so powerful and in the book i talk about a friend of mine named billy that had dementia and he was a cop for a long time i've known him forever and and i knew he was failing and i was going to go see him at at a nursing facility in in fargo North Dakota. And uh, my friends said, you know, Tim, he's not going to recognize you. And I'm like, well, I'm still going to go see him. And so I went and saw him. I had a, a music gig in, in Fargo. And, 
And so I brought my guitar with me and, and he was, he hadn't shaved for a while and he looked awful and he didn't recognize me and he couldn't communicate. He was trying to say words, but they weren't coming out. And, uh, his eyes were kind of glossy and took my guitar case and I set it up on the table. Craig, his eyes cleared up. Mm. He looked at me and he said, you've been doing this a long time, haven't you, Tim? Wow. And I thought, holy smokes, is anybody seeing this? And wow. then as quickly as he did that, they glossed over again. And then he was he was talking incoherently again. But then so I took my guitar out and I started playing like Margaritaville, I think it was. And, and he was mouthing the words to Margaritaville. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, this this dude who I don't know what's going on in the brain. I, I have don't even claim to know, but there was something about the music that was tied to memories yeah. so powerful that it like brought him out of this trance momentarily, but it was like, oh my gosh. And uh, so I, I play music. I'm a vo volunteer for hospice. So like for people near or at the end of their life, uh, yeah. I get the blessing to sit down with them and, and play some tunes. And I was singing How Great Thou Art the moment my mom passed away or I was right next to her and just a beautiful moment. And uh, I just think that that music, if we can tap into that and also like the frustrated, angry music too, we need that sometimes too, because when we're yeah. frustrated- it out, right? Yeah, it's it's great to crank it and and get it out. It's not all going to be kumbaya every day, and and uh, but it's there's just something. So when I'm when I'm doing my keynote presentation, I start out with a song, usually an original song, and then and then as we're going along and and sharing stories, and we're riding this roller coaster and laughing and learning, and, and then we go deep and grab the guitar and I'll crank out another song and just to kind of tie that message in. And then we end with a big fun song at the end of it. So that's what makes it memorable that that experience. And it's just it's I mean it's an honor to to take people's time. Like your your podcast listeners. I mean I'm so respective of their time right now that they're sitting there. Maybe they're at at work. Maybe they're working the night shift and they have their earbuds in and they're and they're right. listening to one percent better and they're learning. You know thinking hey, how can I improve? And so I I just. Totally respect their time and your time. and Well, I, I love, though, how you're bringing, I think part of your the magic of your message is, is you figure out how to bring, first of all, what I read out of it is, Tim, you go you went all the way back to your childhood and go, this isn't the Tim Eggerbratton that my parents raised, or this isn't who I am. And when you felt that multiple times, you said, I got to get back to who I really am. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that rhythm. And then part of, part of that is like, part of who you are as a musician. You, like you said, you think it, you live it, you, you're you constantly surrounded by music and playing music and it brings joy to you and it brings joy to others. So you've been able to take everything in your life, you know, get closer to like who you are and your talents and your life experience, everything you've learned, and now you're giving it to everyone else. So I think that's to me what it means to like find your rhythm because what's, yeah. what's better than that? So. Music is a big part of that. I don't know if it's possible, but would you be uh, willing to play us a song right now? Heck yeah. I wonder if we, uh, let me grab my guitar. All right. This will be All a right. first on 1% Better live music. All right. Well, this is my uh, my father-in-law's guitar, my wife's dad. And okay. uh, we figure he bought this in about 1958. And uh, he passed away several years ago and so none of my wife's family was in the guitar playing at all and and uh so they they said i could get the extended loan on it and so i got the extended loan uh can you hear it does it come through okay yeah yeah so this is a song that i wrote called i am i can and i will all right when i was young my mama said Sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm bad, and sometimes can't control what's going on. But you can always choose how you're going to roll the law. So whenever you're down on the troubles to rise, cloudy days and sunny skies, sing this song to get you over that hill. Sing I I can't, I will. Oh, I am, I can't, I will. Good night, everybody. Drive safe. <laughs> that is so awesome. Thanks for 
sharing that with us. Absolutely. So cool. I love it. Well, what would you say, Tim? I mean, it's just your your message is so great. Um, and I think so many people, I mean, we all need, you know, the stuff that you're talking about at various times, all times of our life. What would you say to people that, first of all, what is it? I mean, I describe my version of what the rhythm of life. So maybe you, how do people know when they're not in the rhythm of life? And what would you give them for advice of how to get into it? Yeah. And the rhythm, that's the thing. The rhythm is going to be different for everybody. Uh, but we know when something's off and it's rhythm and harmony kind of go together. And like that guitar I just played has six strings. And if one of those strings is not tuned properly, the whole thing goes wonky. And so if if there's an aspect of our life, if we're spending too much time at work, obviously the home life might might suffer. And if we're if we're spending all our time at home and then use up our PTO and then the work life is going to suffer. And and so it's this intricate rhythm in this beautiful like symphony of life that uh, so it's going to be different for everybody but we all know when something feels like it's off and so the for me the biggest key is to like sit quietly I do a lot of mindfulness and meditation and when I do that like I was just doing a speaking event last night and when I was playing music, I would look down and I was so focused, I could see my guitar strings just like vibrating and then everything slowed down. And it's just, it's a beautiful experience. I'm doing my thing, but I'm so present. And so I think that's a big part of it is, is like finding 10 minutes in the morning, maybe, or whenever you can carve out 10 minutes of your day. And I know we all get busy, but if you can get 10 minutes of like either a guided meditation or just sit with your thoughts and um, no electronics and whatever. And then I think things start to slow down a little bit and, and you can kind of identify things that are making you anxious. Uh, okay, well, if it's making me anxious, is there anything I can do about it? You know, and most of the time it's going to be no. I mean, you, you oh, it's raining again today or, you know, whatever. The the stock market's doing whatever. And, and uh, so most of the stuff is out of our control, but 100% of the time, we control our attitudes, how we show up, what's coming out of our mouth, what's coming out of our keyboard. We control that. And if we're not being mindful of that and like what we're saying, what we're doing, how we're showing up, if we're a jerk to be around and you say stupid things and mean things, maybe you don't recognize it. Maybe you're not like hearing yourself. And so when we slow down for 10 minutes a day, it really helps to, to kind of understand that. And then like writing a letter of gratitude to somebody that, you know, that they, if they've inspired you to, to write a short note. Uh, and what that does is it forces us to stop focusing on ourselves, the, oh, poor me, look at me. And then you focus on somebody else and you tell them in a letter that they inspire you. And then you send that letter or, or just jotting down three to five parts of your day that you're thankful for before you go to bed, you know, and, and that gratitude and it gets your mind focused on on what what is good and what's positive in your life instead of constantly like beating yourself up over what's going wrong and it's stuff you can't even control anyway. Yeah, that's that's all great great advice. Well, Tim, uh, it's been a blast talking with you. We always finish the show with um, a question, the same question, which is, and we've talked about you know much of this, but you know maybe just sort of summarize, like what is your best you know, 1% better life advice. You're sitting down with your grandkids, you're on your deathbed, or you just want to pass on your best, you know, life lesson. What what would those things be for you? Well, I think right away, I think of what my mom passed down to me and what I'm hoping to pass to my kids and grandkids is that you are, you can, you will. And when you tell yourself that I am, I can, I will, and you believe it, that's the thing, you know, and that's, it takes some, some habit, you know, it feels like you're bragging at first when you say, well, you know what I am, I can, I will. But when you look at it and you really believe that, you know what? Yeah. Today was a crappy day and, and I got fired or I hate my job or whatever it is, you know, but then if you turn that around and you say, you know what? I am going to do better. I can do better. I will do better. And uh, and so that I love that one percent mindset because you're not going to like make sweeping changes overnight. It's not going to happen. But if you continue to like lay the groundwork and you're focusing on 
one piece of your rhythm or that harmony in your life, just a 1% at a time, boy, by the by an, a month's end or a, you know a year's end, uh, that's some substantial growth. So I just think the one thing that I would say to my, if I'm on my deathbed, yeah. I would look to my people and I would say, you know what? You are, you can. You yeah, will. awesome. And that's uh, so true and so you. So thank you, Tim, for sharing uh, your life and uh, sharing with our audience and the world um, all of the, the great things that, that you've learned along the way. I really appreciate it. It's been a blast. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate what you're doing and spreading out this this uh, message of, of just constantly improving. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to the 1% Better Podcast. We hope you found it insightful and useful for your improvement journey. As always, you can access podcast transcripts and links to reference material at tricentialcom forward podcast. If you would like to be a guest on 1% Better, you can do it on the same site. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please like, share, or rate our podcast. Until the next episode, here's to getting 1% better every day.